Take away, David. Thanks, Nir, for the introduction. This is joint work with Dan Bonet, Yuval Ishai, and Amit Sahai. So in the last few years, indistinguishability obfuscation has really emerged as a central hub for cryptography. We have many amazing applications that you can all build from indistinguishability obfuscation and some very simple primitives. And at a very high level, and as you've seen from the previous talks, an indistinguishability obfuscation allows you to take a program and scramble it so that you can hide secrets within the software itself. And that is, this has emerged as a very powerful tool. But we've seen, if we take a closer look at it, what we end up seeing is that there are very, very big constant factors. So when you want to actually use indistinguishability obfuscation to instantiate your favorite cryptographic primitive, you suddenly see polynomial, is a polynomial time algorithm, and yet the constant factors are something like 2 to the 100. So we want this primitive, and yet it still seems very far away from being concretely realizable. And let me just preface here that when we look at the constant factors as big as 2 to the 100, deploying indistinguishability obfuscation is not, about an, is not an engineering problem. It's not just about finding more efficient ways of computing these things. There are actually fundamental theoretical challenges that we have to overcome in order to make these things practically realizable. So our goal in this project is quite ambitious. We wanted to build an find an obfuscation complete primitive that suffices for obfuscating any arbitrary functionality with good concrete efficiency, bring I.O. into practice. And what does that entail? Well, our goal is to identify a functionality whose idealized obfuscation can be used for general functionalities. And moreover, uh, we want this to be efficient. Namely, if you want to obfuscate an arbitrary program, this idealized functionality should only need to be invoked once. So it's sort of this obfuscation complete primitive. What suffices to obfuscate an arbitrary program? And our solution is going to look at, is going to be basically based on the original bootstrapping construction for obfuscation, namely, our obfuscation complete primitive consists of FHE decryption and snark verification. I'm going to get into the details on each of these primitives subsequently in the talk. And as a concurrent goal, once we have like, defined our obfuscation complete primitive, it really boils down to finding efficient representations of these underlying constructions, namely FHE decryption and snark verification. Fully homomorphic encryption seems to be pretty well understood at this point. But, for uh, but uh, an independent goal of this work has also been looking at finding snarks with efficient verification processes that are amenable to the existing obfuscation constructions. So there are two, uh, two uh, goals of this project. One is improving the concrete efficiency of obfuscation, and two, and sort of as a byproduct, finding more efficient snark constructions. So let me give you a sketch today of how we build obfuscation for general functionalities. There are three main types of approaches, and they all rely on, and all of these uh, constructions rely under, on fundamentally on multilinear maps. So the first kind of way of building obfuscation for general circuits relies on a beautiful construction based on bootstrapping introduced by Garg, Gentry, Halevi, Rekova, Sahai, and Waters in 2013. And the starting point here is we begin with a multilinear map. And using multilinear maps, we actually build a weak class of obfuscation, namely obfuscation for log depth circuits, for NC1 circuits, or branching programs. And then in a very nice work, what we can do is we can actually bootstrap NC1 obfuscation to obfuscation for general circuits. I will describe this bootstrapping transformation in greater detail in a subsequent slides. So this, while it looks like a very simple, very natural, very nice, clean, clean framework, if we actually want to instantiate it, and we actually use it to obfuscate even a simple functionality, like an AES or a block cipher, what we immediately see is that we need a multilinear map capable of supporting over 2 to the 100 levels of multilinearity and publishing over 2 to the 100 encodings. This is an astronomical number and very, very far from something that we can practically implement using modern computing resources. So a subsequent line of work by Zimmerman and as well as Applebaum member Kursky looked at directly obfuscating circuits, and this sort of resolves the first, the second problem where we have to publish 2 to the 100 encodings. Unfortunately, due to the noise growth in existing multilinear math candidates, the levels of multilinearity required is still over 2 to the 100, and thus very, very far from concretely realizable. In a recent line of work initiated by Lin in 2016, we have now non-black box constructions of obfuscation. So these are constructions that rely only on constant degree multilinear maps, uh, and this constant uh, in the recent work has been reduced to something as low as 3. So using just trilinear maps, we can actually construct obfuscation. However, there is one big caveat. They require non-black box use of the underlying multilinear map. And if you look at the internal details of existing multilinear map constructions, they are really, really complicated. And as a result, non-black box uh, constructions are going to present major hurdles in terms of concrete implementability. 
So the focus of this work will be on constructing obfuscation and making use that make non that make black box use of the underlying multilinear map. And we're going to focus on actually the simplest or the original construction of obfuscation based on bootstrapping. So this is a, a two-stage uh, pipeline where we start with some multilinear maps, build obfuscation for branching programs, and then leverage obfuscation for branching programs to obtain obfuscation for general circuits. Most of the prior work in this area have focused on improving the efficiency of the first step of this pipeline, namely the uh, obfuscation for branching programs. In this work, we're going to look at the second uh, stage of the pipeline, and this is where we're going to extract our obfuscation complete primitive. Uh, let me just give you a high-level summary of our main result in an obfuscation front. To obfuscate AES using our new uh, uh, construction, we require a multilinear map capable of supporting about 4,000 levels of multilinearity. And if you look at it uh, compared to the existing work, this is many, many orders of magnitude of improvement. We went from 2 to the 100 to roughly 2 to the 12. OK, so let me first remind you how we bootstrap obfuscation. What is our uh, obfuscation complete primitive that we seek to build? So to obfuscate a circuit, what we do is we first encrypt it using a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Now, using the fully homomorphic properties of the underlying encryption scheme, the evaluator can homomorphically compute the circuit on any input of its choosing, and in doing so, obtain an encryption of the circuit evaluation. Now, we need some way of taking the encryption of the circuit evaluation and extracting from it the actual output. So what we're going to do is we're going to rely on our obfuscation for uh, branching programs and publish a decryption circuit, and in particular, an obfuscation of the decryption circuit that will implement the FAG decryption. Now, certainly, we can't give the, the evaluator an arbitrary decryption oracle, because otherwise, the evaluator can simply decrypt the circuit. So what we're going to require, in addition, is that the evaluator provide a proof that when it did the circuit evaluation, that the ciphertext it obtains to be decrypted should actually be one that was derived from evaluating the program on an honestly generated input. And so the evaluator includes a proof, and the, and the uh, bootstrapping algorithm will first check the proof before decrypting. So let's look at concretely what the program looks like that we need to obfuscate. Uh, it will contain embedded inside it a decryption key for the underlying FHG scheme, and maybe a CRS or some other verification state used for the proof verification process. And the functionality that we need to obfuscate needs to do two things. It needs to verify a proof, and if the proof... Uh -oh. uh, let's click this. It needs to verify a proof, and then it also needs to decrypt the resulting ciphertext. So if we look at what kind of obfuscation constructions we have today, uh, the, the ones that, we, at least in this bootstrapping construction, they operate over branching programs. So when we actually want to build this obfuscation complete primitive, we want something that can be easily implemented by a branching program. And the complexity is generally captured by the length of the branching program. So we need FHE decryption and, snark ver and uh, proof verification to be implementable by simple uh, and short branching programs. And luckily for us, uh, the existing works on lattice-based FHE schemes in all of these existing constructions, or in most of these existing constructions at least, uh, decryption can be implemented by a rounded inner product, which actually is amenable to branching program-based computation. So what, uh, what we really need now is simply a way to verify these proofs efficiently. And that's where we get uh, to, uh-oh, uh, okay. And that's where we get to uh, the need for SNARKs. So first, let me remind you what a SNARK is. So our overarching goal uh, in improving the concrete efficiency of obfuscation is building better SNARKs, uh, or better branching program-friendly uh, succinct non-interactive arguments. Okay, so let me remind you what a succinct non-interactive argument is. So this is also known as a SNARK. Uh, it consists of three algorithms. There's a setup algorithm that takes a security parameter and outputs a common reference string and a verification state. And then there's the familiar prove and verify algorithms that takes, uh, the prover algorithm takes in the CRS, takes in a statement and a witness, outputs a proof. The, verifi the verification algorithm takes in this uh, proof, takes in a statement, and is possibly the verification state and decides whether to accept or reject. A SNARK should satisfy the usual notions of completeness and computational soundness, but the important property is that it should be succinct. Recall that the obfuscated program needs to both take as input the proof as well as verify the proof, so succinctness is paramount to the success of this work. So the succinctness property in the succinct non-interactive argument system stipulates that the proof size and the runtime of the verifier should all be polylogarithmic in the running time of the computation that's being verified, or in the case of circuit satisfiability, polylogarithmic in the size of the circuit. 
More concretely, what it means is that the runtime of the verifier can be polynomial in a security parameter, the length of the statement, polylogarithmic in a circuit size, and similarly for the proof size. So our main result in this work on constructing more branching program efficient SNARKs specially tailored for bootstrapping obfuscation is we actually obtain new designated verifier SNARKs with qualitatively better properties that I will summarize below. Uh, so the designated verifier part of this statement means that the verification stage should be secret. And it's also in a pre-processing model, which allows us to basically have a more expensive setup procedure. So the setup procedure that generates the CRS need not be super efficient. It can be run in time polynomial in the running time of the computation or the circuit size. But in this model, what we achieve is the first snark that simultaneously satisfies what we call quasi-optimal succinctness and quasi-optimal prover complexity. Let me briefly describe for you what I mean by these terms. When I state the asymptotics for our snark construction, these are going to be numbers that, or complexity reported for achieving negligible soundness error against provers of bounded size, of size two to the lambda. So when I say a proof system is quas satisfies quasi-optimal succinctness, that means the length of the proof should be quasi-linear in the security parameter. So a lambda times some polylogarithmic term. When I say a proof system is quasi satisfies quasi-optimal prover complexity, what I mean is that the amount of work that the prover has to do to generate a proof is only quasi-linear in the size of the circuit and does not depend, say, uh, linearly in the security parameter. So in most existing SNARK constructions today, and I will summarize those at the end of the talk, the approver complexity or the approver overhead will be linear or worse in the security parameter. A SNARK would be quasi-optimal approver complexity if that overhead is only polylogarithmic. So we give the first SNARK from any assumption that actually simultaneously satisfies both of these properties. And as an additional bonus, because our new star constructions are, can be instantiated based on lattice assumptions, they are plausibly resist quantum attacks. So we give post-quantum secure snarks, and they also work over polynomial size fields, which will be very important when we look at the concrete example of bootstrapping obfuscation. Let me now describe for you how our snark construction works. Our starting point is of building these pre-processing snarks builds on a very beautiful work by Bitansky, Chiesa, Ishai, Ostrovsky, and Panet. Their construction takes a two-step two approach. First, they begin with an information-theoretic primitive called a linear PCP, and they compile that to a two-round linear interactive proof system. Then, on top of the two-round linear interactive proof, they provide a cryptographic compiler, namely linear-only encryption, that compiles it to a pre-processing snark. Let me briefly revisit for you some of the core uh, building blocks of this construction. First, we have linear PCPs, first used in a work by Ishai Kushilevitz and Ostrovsky. And a linear PCP is just a long proof vector. And in a linear PCP model, we have a verifier, and a verifier is basically given access to a linear function. And what the verifier can do is it can submit a query vector to the linear PCP oracle. And the linear PCP oracle is simply going to compute the inner product between the query and the proof vector. And it, this can repeat several times, and at the end, the verifier decides whether to accept or reject the proof. There are several concrete instantiations of linear PCP-based constructions based either on a Hadamard code or based on the quadratic spam programs and quadratic arithmetic programs of Gennaro, Gentry, Parno, and Rakova. So oftentimes, and very importantly for our construction, the verifier is actually oblivious. Namely, the queries that the verifier submits to the linear PCP oracle do not depend on a statement being proved, nor do they depend on the previous responses. So what this means is that we can have an equivalent view where the verifier, instead of submitting many vectors, it can pack all of its queries together in a single query matrix, where the columns are precisely the queries that it would have submitted to the linear PCP oracle. And in this case, the linear PCP oracle will compute the matrix vector product. Now, in order to go from linear PCPs to pre-processing snarks, the key idea is that the oblivious verifier would first commit to its queries because its queries don't depend on a statement being proved or the responses of the previous results. It can actually just commit to these queries and publish them as part of the CRS. What the honest prover would then do is it would take a statement and its witness, it would construct from it a linear PCP, and then it would simulate the operation of the linear PCP oracle, namely, it would compute the matrix vector product and send it to the verifier. Now, this is a great, great uh, uh, analogy, but it doesn't quite work. And there are so many problems with this basic construction. So first of all, the malicious prover can actually choose the proof based on knowledge of the queries. If we simply publish the queries in the clear in the CRS, this cannot possibly work, because the prover can now choose its proof based on what the verifier is going to check. And moreover, the malicious prover is not really constrained to only, uh, imp uh, to only evaluating linear functions. The prover can do arbitrary things uh, when constructing its proof. So we need some way of, of addressing both of these problems. 
So for the first problem, it's actually very easy. Instead of publishing the queries in the clear, we're going to encrypt them using an additively homomorphic encryption scheme. So the additive homomorphism allows the prover to still compute the responses over the encrypted query vectors, and the verifier at the end would decrypt the encrypted proof that the prover constructs, and then apply the underlying linear PCP verification procedure. So it turns out that the second problem is actually a more severe one, which is that the malicious prover can actually apply different linear functions, or different functions altogether, to the different components of the query matrix. The way that we address this is we're actually going to make a cryptographic conjecture. This is the second step of the compilation framework where we impose a cryptographic tool, where we use crypto in order to uh, complete the transformation. In our work, we rely on a new primitive we call linear-only vector encryption. Let me briefly describe to you what a linear-only vector encryption scheme is. So first, a vector encryption scheme is just an additively homomorphic encryption scheme that where the plain text space is a vector space over some field or some ring. So instead of encrypting scalars, we encrypt vectors at a time. And the encryption scheme should be both semantically secure as well as be additively homomorphic. Namely, it should be possible, given encryptions of many vectors, to compute an encryption of a linear combination of those vectors. The second part, which is the important property, is the linear-only property. And here we have a, very, we have a fairly strong non-falsifiable assumption, which basically states the following. For an any adversary is given access to a collection of ciphertexts, and it's going to then produce a ciphertext, there exists some extractor that can explain the adversary's behavior. Namely, the extractor takes as input this collection of ciphertexts, and it outputs a linear combination such that any ciphertext that the adversary produces can be also derived by just simply computing a linear combination on the underlying plain text vectors. So the way that this works uh, is the following. So in, in our, when we take our linear PCP, we take our query matrix, and we're going to encrypt each row of the query matrix using our linear-only vector encryption scheme. What, uh, and then, once the prover constructs its ciphertext, well, linear-only property says that whatever the prover's strategy is, it can be explained by taking a linear function of the queries, them, of the, uh, of the queries themselves. And this means that by soundness of the underlying linear PCP system against linearly bounded provers, we get uh, secure soundness of the resulting snark construction. Let me just briefly compare with the framework of Vitansky et al. So if, as I said earlier, their framework starts by taking a linear PCP and applying in, first applying an information theoretic construction where they impose an additional consistency check to force the prover to commit to, uh, to apply linear functions to the different query vectors. In our work, we, we skip this step and give a direct compilation from linear PCPs by making a stronger cryptographic assumption, uh, namely linear-only vector encryption, that bounds the prover to only applying consistent linear functions to the verifier's queries. So how do we actually instantiate this construction? So what are the main conjecture in this work is that regex-based encryption over standard lattices, named, and specifically the variant due to Piker, Vaikuntha, Nath, and Waters, provide is a linear-only vector encryption scheme. So let me just show you how the decryption functionality works, because that's the only part that really matters uh, for the application to obfuscation. So uh, in a decryption in, a, uh, in the underlying uh, regex-based encryption scheme, it's just computing a rounded inner product. The secret key is a matrix, the ciphertext is a single vector, and the decryption operation just computes the inner product between the secret key matrix and the ciphertext, and then rounds to a small, uh, group, uh, small field element. Uh, and one way that you can see this, if you're familiar with regex-based encryption, is that each row is essentially an independent regex secret key, and there's one ciphertext vector that encrypts the, all of the entries of the vector. So once we actually uh, take our linear-only vector encryption scheme and, and uh, combine it with existing and known linear PCP constructions, we actually get a pre-processing SNARK. And here I give you some concrete comparisons with other uh, constructions of SNARKs today. Uh, so I think the takeaway here is that using our new compiler, because it is, gives a direct compilation from linear PCPs directly to pre-processing SNARKs, we actually obtain the first quasi-optimal SNARK uh, if we instantiate using a ring learning with errors-based assumption. And moreover, because our new constructions actually rely on lattice-based assumptions, while all of the existing ones rely primarily on pairing-based assumptions, these are the first SNARK constructions that are positively post-quantum resistant and at the same time provide uh, qu qualitatively and asymptotically uh, better uh, performance in terms of prover complexity as well as proof size. So at the beginning of the talk, I presented to you the problem of improving the concrete efficiency of obfuscation. So let me conclude by, saying a, by giving a few more remarks. 
So recall that to bootstrap obfuscation, it suffices to obfuscate a program that implements FHE decryption and SNARK verification using F existing FHE encryption techniques and our new lattice-based SNARK candidates. We obtain an obfuscation complete primitive that requires a multilinear map that supports 2 to the 12, so roughly 4,000 degrees of multilinearity, and it requires publishing about 2 to the 44 encodings. These numbers are fairly large but, uh, and likely to not be feasible today, but they are much, much uh, better than the 2 to the 100 needed in previous black box construction, and we hope that future work will continue to improve upon these numbers. And moreover, by looking into this problem of bootstrapping obfuscation, it actually led us to constructing better uh, SNARK constructions. In particular, our work gives a new direct and a more direct framework of building SNARKs directly from linear PCPs. And these yield both the first quasi-succinct construction from standard lattices, as well as the first quasi-optimal SNARK from any assumption, in our case, from the ring learnings of Sarah's problems, plus this linear-only vector encryption property. Let me conclude with the several open problems. All of the SNARK constructions that I described here, uh, based on lattices, are only secretly verifiable, or namely, they're in a designated verifier model where uh, the soundness only holds if, this, if the, the proof system, to verify the proofs, requires uh, knowledge of the secret decryption key. Uh, one important question is whether we can do it in a publicly verifiable SNARK, get an analog of pairing-based uh, SNARK construction. Another question is trying to achieve a stronger notion of quasi-optimality. So at the beginning of the talk, when I introduced the, our metric for assessing the asymptotics of a SNARK construction, the goal was to achieve negligible soundness error against two to the lambda bounded provers. You can also have, uh, stipulate that we should try to achieve the stronger notion of actually two to the minus lambda soundness against the same kind of provers. And finally, our new metals based SNARK candidates, we should assess the concrete efficiency of them because they seem to be lighter weight. They have asymptotically uh, stronger properties compared to the existing pairing based candidates. So we're in the process of actually de developing implementations of these lattice-based SNARKs and comparing them against the existing pairing-based candidates. And with that, I'll take uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, so we have time for a question or two. Yeah, you like? I have a question about uh, what do you mean by the quasi-optimal snark? Can you explain or explain again? Uh, sure. So quasi-optimality consists of two properties. So first is quasi-succinctness, which says to achieve uh, soundness that's negligible in a security parameter against provers of size 2 to the lambda. What we want is that the proof size is only quasi-linear in a security parameter. And the second property we want is that the prover complexity, so the amount of work it takes to generate a proof, that overhead should only be polylogarithmic in the security parameter, so namely quasi-linear in a circuit size. Yes, so that's what our new SLARC constructions achieve, and is the first SLARC from any assumption that simultaneously achieves both of these properties. Okay, time for one more question. I have a small question, so uh, like regarding the proof of security, so mm -hmm. currently it's sort of like strong assumptions, right? Like. Mm -hmm. uh, virtual black box, yes. uh, et cetera. Is there hope to sort of, you know, base it on, on distinguishability obfuscation, things that we uh, believe to right. be sort of? Yeah, so right now I, I would view this construction as sort of a heuristic construction of uh, obfuscation. Um, so in terms of basing it on indistinguishability obfuscation, I think that basic bootstrapping construction is uh, going to be rather difficult to, uh, uh, to make work in terms of a security reduction because uh, relaxing from statistical soundness to computational soundness will introduce problems there. So I think there's some theoretical challenges uh, to even making a basic bootstrapping approach, but hope maybe with newer techniques, uh, we can do something about that as well. 